Amen. A couple of weeks ago, I was uh, in a church member's home, and I saw on their wall a painting that was exactly like one that hung in various rooms of my parents' houses growing up. We moved fairly frequently because my dad was in the Navy when I was young, and each time we moved, that painting was put in a new spot. But putting it up always made the new house that we were in feel like it was home. So when I saw that painting hanging on this person's wall, I was instantly flooded with memories that happened, gathered together with family and friends in the rooms where that picture hung. Isn't it amazing how physical objects can evoke such powerful memories? This morning we are starting a new sermon series called Lessons from the Toy Chest. This time of year we try to pick sermon series that um, can kind of catch the attention of some of our younger members and our families to bring them into the church and help them understand what we're talking about. So last year we did, if you remember, we did um, something with Dr. Seuss. I can't remember the name of the sermon series now. And so this year we're going to talk about Lessons from the Toy Chest. And that might seem a little weird, but something teachers and those who study um, our development know is that we learn lots of lessons through play. We learn things like how to follow rules and take turns. We often have an opportunity to practice counting or recognizing our letters and numbers. We have childhood toys that help us engage our imagination and discover how things work. We may have even learned a lot about our siblings and friends when we played games with them, like Johnny Always Cheats or Trisha has to follow all the rules exactly. If you play a game with me, I follow all of the rules. We do not go off book. And Charlie is colorblind, so he has to hold the cards right next to each other in order to be able to tell the difference when you play cards with him. We learned a lot from all of those games we played growing up. Reflecting as adults on our childhood toys can represent those lessons to us in ways that help us to solidify them in our adulthood. We can also learn other lessons that completely went over our heads when we were young. So in this sermon series, we're going to use classic children's toys to reflect on biblical truths about God and the world around us. So as you already know from John's children's message this morning, we are starting this morning with Play-Doh. I brought some with me to play with while I preach this morning. I love Play-Doh. I'm one of those really weird people who likes the smell of Play-Doh. I know that's a little strange. Um, But I I think uh, one of the things I like about Play-Doh is that you get to touch it and squish it. I love the feel of it. I was a tactile kid, and so I loved being able to squish and squeeze things beneath my fingers and toes. I still love to walk in the mud and the sand. It's one of my favorite things to do. With Play-Doh, you can make whatever you want. There's something that I always found um, both freeing and intimidating about Play-Doh. I loved that there was no wrong way to do it. While I like to follow the rules, I also liked about Play-Doh that there were no rules to follow, right? You can do it any way you want. With Play-Doh, you are limited only by your imagination and the skill of the person wielding the Play-Doh. As a child, I had a lot of imagination. I would dream of being able to sculpt these amazing new creatures that didn't exist anywhere except in my imagination. Now, unfortunately for me, my sculpting skills did not exactly match my imagination. My creations never looked like what they looked like in my head. I was not very skilled at Play-Doh, but I loved to do it. And one of the things about Play-Doh that gave me perhaps a little more joy than it should have was squishing my creations when they didn't come out right. Anybody else like to do that in the end when you're done to squish it back together? It was sort of like the Play-Doh equivalent of, um, of building a really tall tower of blocks and then the joy of then knocking it over. I also still love to do that. It's my favorite thing to do with little kids is build towers and knock them over. So that's the thing about Play-Doh. When the sculpture doesn't come out right, you can mold it and tweak it and reshape it until it is just right. Or you can just squish it and start all over. It is that pliable nature of Play-Doh and clay that the Bible uses to teach us a little about God's interaction with us. This passage from Jeremiah that Chandra read is one of the most memorable passages from the whole book of Jeremiah. The image of God as the potter and us as the clay is so striking and captures our imagination. You can picture it just as Jeremiah says. Countless sermons have been written on it. The imagery is captured in poem and prayer and song. We've already sung one of the songs this morning about it. And often, when we read this passage about God being the potter and us being the clay, we think of it in an individual, personal sense. The hymn that we're going to sing at the end of worship today, Have Thine Own Way, says it this way. Have thine own way, Lord, have thine own way. Thou art the potter, I am the clay. Mold me and make me. 
Even the song is about me and my life. We might sing it together as a group, but we sing it about our individual lives being shaped. And that's definitely worth discussing and thinking about. And as John said, there's also a passage in Isaiah that uh, gives the imagery of potter and clay there too, that talks about us as individuals. But that's not the message that God delivered to Jeremiah and asked him to share with the people. In this particular passage, God was talking about shaping not the individual, but the whole community of faith. You might notice within it that instead of saying you in an individual sense, God says, you, O house of Israel. God is talking about the collective community of faith and the need for the whole community to be reshaped, not just the individual. I want to talk to you a minute just about prophets and what Jeremiah's job was. You might remember me telling you a while ago that the prophet's job in the Old Testament is less like a foreseer or a foreteller and more like a person who holds up a mirror to someone, letting them see what's really going on and what the consequences of their current behavior was. So the prophet's job was to remind the Israelites of their covenant with God, of what God expected this people that he'd fashioned to be like at times when they were not necessarily holding up their end of the covenant. Now, this was certainly true for Jeremiah. It's what we read in, uh, in his book. His call is rooted in Israel's constitution and purpose. That is, his message is one that is aimed to help the Israelites remember, recall, explore their own stories, their own traditions, and their own history. He reminds them that God is the one who called Abraham and Sarah. That God is the one who liberated their descendants from slavery and made a covenant with them in order to form them into a holy nation, into a distinct people. He reminds them that this covenant with God and the blessings, provision, and protection that comes with it also comes with expectations that the Israelites will act with justice and kindness and obedience. Over and over and over, Jeremiah and the other prophets are called upon to remind them of this covenant and to help them see the consequences that come from ignoring their part in the covenant. So our text today comes after Jeremiah has resumed his preaching. King Josiah, sometimes known as the great covenant reformer, has died. Josiah was instrumental in helping the Israelites return to a covenant relationship with God after a long absence, after they had been ignoring God for a long time. But he has died, and eventually a new king, Jehoiakim, comes to the throne. Now, he is basically a puppet of the Egyptian regime that has taken over, and he has no intention of continuing the reforms that Josiah began. So Jeremiah is called once again by God to return to the preaching that he had suspended during Josiah's reign because the people had listened and turned back to God, so they had no more need for him to hold up a mirror for them. So he comes back to warn them that God's judgment can come and sweep them away if they choose to disobey the covenant that they've made. This passage opens up with a command from God to Jeremiah to go to the potter's house, where he is told a word from the Lord will come to him. Now, it's important to note that this was probably not the first time that Jeremiah had gone gone to the potter's house. The kind of pottery that they're talking about in the passage is not the stuff that we get that looks really nice and we put it up on a shelf and never use it, but it's the kind they would have used every day. It was the inexpensive earthenware that they used for holding grain and wine and other household items. It was fragile and broken very easily and often, and so often had to be replaced and repaired. So Jeremiah had probably probably made many trips to the potter's house. But this time, God tells him to go and he will hear something new. Now, you can probably picture what Jeremiah describes, right? If you've ever seen someone throw a pot on the wheel, you can picture it in your head. Working clay is demanding and time-consuming, and often the thing that the potter intends to make grows misshapen, just like with my Play-Doh when I was little. If either too much pressure or too little pressure is applied, what he intended to make doesn't happen. Maybe the walls of the bowl grow too thin or the shape of the cup isn't right. And when that happens, the potter has to collapse the whole thing back onto the wheel and begin again. And that's what Jeremiah observes, this process of the potter beginning to make something and it not working and him having to smush it back onto the wheel and begin a second time. 
God turns it into a metaphor for the way that God works within communities that are called for his purpose. God says, just like the potter took that misshapen clay and reworked it, so too can God do with us, with our community. Now, there is, on the one hand, in the passage, a sense of judgment. It's a little bit scary to think that God can smash us like clay. But there's also a sense of hope that God can and will make something new, reforming and remolding us for his purpose. Now, we've certainly seen throughout history that God is capable of reshaping the church. The circumstance of society and who was in power and what the world needed dictated the shape of the church. The purpose and mission of the church has always been the same, but how that gets lived out has looked very different over time. Initially, the church was a bunch of believers who gathered together in people's houses. As the church became persecuted, the church went underground, gathering in secret. And then when Constantine legalized Christianity, churches were able to begin building big buildings and gathering in public, and they created formalized leadership. And then throughout the centuries, the church has been continually reshaped and remolded. There was the Protestant Reformation. It used to be that we were all Catholic, that there was only one Christian denomination. In fact, Catholic, when we use it in the Apostles' Creed, means uh, universal. But when certain people or groups in the church began to misuse their power and strayed away from how God intended the church to live out its mission and purpose in the world, God raised up prophets like Mount Martin Luther and reformers to reshape the church. That led to reform within the Catholic church as well as the birth of new denominations. And then we can look at our own Methodist movement. The Methodist movement was shaped and reshaped and reshaped by several different splits as schisms over issues like slavery and what exactly it means to live a holy life came to the forefront. Today, the global church and the United Methodist Church as a denomination continues to wrestle with what it looks like to live faithfully in this time and place. It's also something that we have wrestled with here at the individual local church level. There are times when people say things like, things just aren't like they used to be, or we used to do, or used to have, or used to be. It's a lament, right? A wish to go back to the way things were, a desire to keep things the same as they used to be. But we know from scripture that God doesn't intend for us to stay static or the same. God doesn't want the church to be a museum or a monument. God wants the church to be a body growing, changing, dynamic, constantly being reshaped and reformed. That's what we see both in scripture and in the history of the church. Just like God designs each of us individuals with a specific purpose in mind, so too God shaped and forms each church, each community of faith, for a specific purpose. Think about the original covenant that God makes with Abraham. He says this, I will make you a great nation, and I will bless you. I will make your name great, and so you shall be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you, and the one who curses you I will curse, and in you all the families of the earth will be blessed. Or these words that he speaks to Israel through the prophet Isaiah. I, the Lord, have called you in righteousness and will hold your hand. I will keep you and give you as a covenant to the people, as a light to the Gentiles, to open blind eyes, to bring out prisoners from prison, to bring out those who sit in darkness from the prison house. Did you catch it? In both scriptures, he makes a covenant with Israel so that through them, all the families of the earth will be blessed. He forms Israel into a people, into a nation, so that they are the light to the world. That is their purpose. I want you to think of it this way. I told you I'm not very good at shaping clay, but here it is. Think of it this way. See this bowl? It's a bowl. Imagine it in your head. If I were to pour water into my bowl the water would take the shape of the pot, right? Its purpose is to hold whatever I put into it. However, if I were to make a hole in my pot, there's the hole, it's no longer serving its purpose, right? Whatever I put into it is gonna come out of it. It's no longer shaping and holding the water that I pour. That's what God does with Israel. God shapes them into a vessel so that through them, the rest of the world can be shaped. And that's what God does with the church. God molds us into a vessel with a purpose so that through the church, people will come into a deeper relationship with God and that through their relationship with God, the world can be transformed. That is our purpose. 
And if the vessel isn't fulfilling its purpose, it has to be reformed and remade and reworked and reshaped. There's a United Methodist Church called Mount Vernon Place that sits at the corner of 9th and Massachusetts in Washington, D.C. When the monumental building was dedicated in 1919, the church must have been very proud of its grand structure. It has these big commanding columns that fits in with the architecture around it, these huge regal steps that it just is really fun to walk up. It's a building designed to hold thousands of people at one time. And during the 1960s, the church had over 4,000 members on its rolls. Now, as times changed, so did the church. Membership dwindled, and the church had trouble maintaining the massive facilities at so grand a level. Their stately porches began to attract homeless men and women, so the church installed big metal gates to prevent people from sleeping on their grand porch. Ten years ago, the church received a new pastor, Reverend Donna Claycomb Sokol. The church decided after a time of uh, visioning and um, discerning together to take down their gates. And it wasn't long before their unhoused neighbors returned to sleeping on the porch. Now, they chose, instead of running people off the porch, to welcome them. They set up a few simple rules for sleeping on the porch, and those who don't follow the rules are asked lovingly to leave. But they knew that God was calling this church to do even more. So over the years, new ministries have sprung up. They have a shower ministry three times a week for their unhoused neighbors. They serve a free meal once or twice a month. Existing ministries continue to evolve as they consult with others who have more experience working with this population. Now, while they no longer allow people to sleep on their porch because of the harm it could do to their guests, they are committed to serving the unhoused in the city. They are finding new and life-changing ways to walk alongside their neighbors, all because they are willing to let God continually remold and reshape them. Those of you who have been around Epworth for a while know that Epworth has had some difficult years. When I was first appointed here three years ago, it wasn't at all uncommon for me to hear things like, we aren't as big as we used to be, or we've lost some of what I loved about this church. It's been really wonderful over the last few years to watch joy and enthusiasm return to some of the members of the church. There is a real sense in them that God isn't done with us, that God can still use us, and that with God's help, we can help make the world a better place. And we've certainly seen this kind of reshaping here before, right? I was just talking to a member this week about the amazing move this congregation decided to make out of an industrial area into a neighborhood, into where the community and the people were. It took courage and vision, and it took a lot out of the church. There were some who didn't like the move. They may have felt like they were losing their identity or their history. There were people who left. Some couldn't take the stress of the build or the weight to move into a new building. But in the end, it was worth it. God used that move to reshape us into something new, into a church in the heart of the community with the community at heart. The truth is that unlike clay or Play-Doh, we are not inanimate objects. We have a free will and the ability to resist or comply with the shaping that God's doing in our lives. Epworth has largely chosen to lean into the reshaping that God is doing in our lives, and we have to continue to do so. We have to spend time discerning what God is calling us to do next. We've got to ask the hard questions and prayerfully wrestle with who God is calling us as a community to be. Inevitably, some things are going to have to change. Things aren't always going to stay the same, just as they don't stay the same in your families, right? People grow up and get married and move away and have babies of their own, and they come back, and we do all sorts of things. In our life, God may pull the clay a little here and ask us to start a new ministry or pinch a little clay there and ask us to stop doing a ministry we've done for decades. With a little twist of the hand of the clay of our work and life together can be completely transformed. That smell of Play-Doh that brings me right back to my childhood is one that should also be a reminder for us of how God is reshaping us, constantly reshaping us as individuals and as a community together. And while I didn't and still don't have the sculpting skills to bring about my wildest imaginations, God is a master potter. God is able to shape and form us into something beyond our wildest imaginations if we let him. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God.